From the safety of secret committees They talk about the danger of war Remember that the 60s happened in the early 70s, right? So we have to remember that. And that's sort of when I came of age. So I saw a lot of this. And to me, the spark of that was that there was something beyond sort of what you see every day. Far from the smell of the gun. It's the same thing that causes people to want to be poets instead of bankers. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And I think that that same spirit can be put into products. And those products can be manufactured and given to people and they can sense that spirit. To help you understand all this, I will now take off my clothes. Well, why? He says, well, uh, frame relay is scalable. Jim Warren knows better than most what the hippie movement did for the PC. A 60s radical himself, he staged the West Coast Computer Fair, for a time the biggest computer show in the world. The fair was where the PC really arrived. It's also where Jim got rich. So, uh, Jim, is this where you hold all your meetings? Um, as many as possible. <laughs> sure, why not? This is how Silicon Valley entrepreneurs uh, conduct business? Uh, I don't know whether it's how entrepreneurs conduct Believe it or not, no, Jim once taught no, mathematics at a Catholic <laughs> girls' school. Uh, bubble swap? Sure. Okay. Jim was immediately fascinated by the PC, like many Bay Area hippies. The California counterculture was crucial to the PC's development. And, and the whole spirit there was working together, was sharing. You shared your dope, you shared your bed, you shared, uh, uh, you shared your life, you shared your hopes. And uh, a whole bunch of us had the same community spirit, and that permeated the whole Homebrew Computer Club. As soon as somebody would solve a problem, they'd come running down to the Homebrew Computer Club's next meeting, say, hey, everybody, you know that problem that all of us have been trying to figure out how to solve? Here's the solution. Isn't this wonderful? Aren't I a great guy? And it's my contention that that is a major component of why Silicon Valley was able to develop the technology as rapidly as it did, because we were all sharing. Everybody won. Out of this creative show and tell came Apple Computer, the first mass-market PC company. The Apple founders, a couple of recent graduates from Homestead High, were regulars at homebrew meetings. Steve Wozniak was the technical wizard, and Steve Jobs was the visionary who saw microcomputers as a possible business. The first Apple computer was primitive. It was cobbled together by Woz to impress his friends at the homebrew meetings. Everybody was interested in computers, so I started getting a crowd around me because even though I was too shy to raise my hand and say anything in a club meeting, after the club meetings, I would put my, my computer that I had built, and every week it had a little bit more working on it, too. But I would set it down and let people type on the keyboard. I would explain what's in it. If they come up to me and ask a question, I can answer. Um, you know, nowadays, I would have the ability to tell them what it is, you know, and be a little bit more promotional, but back then I could only answer questions if they asked me. But I got a group that started gathering around me. And Steve Jobs saw that I had a lot of interest around me at the club, and he said, let's start selling it. And uh, let's make this company. Came up with the name Apple, and, uh, and uh, that's how it started. Apple was at best a funky company, started by a couple of teenage hackers who previously had been working as Alice in Wonderland characters in a local shopping mall. And they started it in this garage right here. The first Apple computer was built here. Now there are more than 10 million in use around the world. And I was there. Well, for a short time, I was an employee at Apple Computer, employee number 12, and one day I helped move materials out of this garage. At the time, Steve Jobs said the company was short of loot, so he offered to pay me in company shares, but I held out for the money. My mother still reminds me of that incident. The Apple I was even less of a computer than the Altair a single circuit board that came with neither a case nor a keyboard. Still, Steve Jobs managed to sell 50 Apple Ones. That experience showed Jobs that there was a market for a real computer, the Apple II. It was very clear to me that while there were a bunch of hardware hobbyists that could assemble their own computers or at least take our board and add the transformers for the power supply and the case and the keyboard and go get, a, you know, et cetera, go get the rest of the stuff, for every one of those, there were a thousand people that couldn't do that but wanted to mess around with programming. Software hobbyists. Just like I had been when I was, you know, 10. 
discovering that computer. And so my dream for the Apple II was to sell the first real packaged computer. Steve Jobs' dream was impossible. It needed too many chips making the product too complicated and expensive to build. But Woz didn't know it was impossible. And then I got into a way of why have memory for your TV screen and memory for your computer make them one. And that shrunk the chips down and I shrunk the chips here and why not take all these timing circuits. I looked through manuals and found a chip that did it in one chip instead of five and reduced that. And one thing after another after another happened. I wound up with so few chips. When I was done, I said, hey, a computer that you could program to generate colored patterns on a screen or data or words or play games or anything. And it was just the computer I wanted, you know, for myself pretty much. And, uh, but it had turned out so good. He said, I think we have a computer we could sell a thousand a month of. How could you sell a thousand a month, you know? But we needed some money for tooling the case and things like that. We needed, we needed a few hundred thousand dollars. That was a lot of money for two people who had nothing in their lives to speak of, didn't have a $400 bank account. So I went looking for some venture capital. The scruffy 19-year-old seduced the conservative world of venture capitalists. The man Jobs persuaded to part with his cash was Arthur Rock, the inventor of venture capital and the man who had originally funded Intel. At least the Intel boys had graduated from university and owned suits. Well, he uh, wore sandals and he uh, had long, very long hair and uh, beard and mustache, but very articulate. He uh, was, I, th I think he, at one time in his life, and it was probably when I first met him, that he ate nothing but fruit. So as a mainline venture capitalist, is this... Is this, is this, this is not the norm. <laughs> this is not the norm. With money in hand and under occasional adult supervision from an ex-Intel manager named Mike Markala, Waz and Jobs finished the Apple II and ordered a local factory to build 1,000 machines. Two years passed between the Altair and the Apple II, and in that time a lot of things changed. We went from a computer that was designed for hobbyists and engineers and certainly looked like a piece of test equipment to a computer that looked like a piece of consumer electronics. And we can thank Steve Jobs for that. His sense of design demanded that this structural foam case be used for the Apple II, the first case of its type on a personal computer. And not that there wasn't good engineering inside either. The Apple II was a model of efficient engineering. Here's the floppy disk drive controller, for example. There are eight chips here where previously there would have been 35. This is an amazing bit of engineering that we can attribute to Steve Wozniak, who was certainly the Mozart of digital design. And all told, it turned the Apple II into a sensation. The Apple II was launched at Jim Warren's West Coast Computer Fair, one of the first big microcomputer shows. The 1978 show drew thousands of attendees and dozens of exhibitors, many of them members of the Homebrew Computer Club, which spawned most of the early microcomputer companies. But there was only one company showing something that looked like a modern personal computer. Right by the entrance, in a prime spot negotiated by Steve Jobs, sat the Apple II. It mesmerized all who saw it. My recollection is we stole the show. And a lot of dealers and distributors started lining up, and we were off and running. How old were you? Twenty-one. Twenty-one. Yeah. Drive up the Chevy and drive out to the beach. Following the West Coast Computer Fair, the next two years were ones of explosive growth for Apple, with thousands of customers arriving on the doorstep of the tiny office in Cupertino, California. Sales and profits grew so quickly that Apple had more money than the company could spend. And the company was very young. The founders were in their 20s, and some employees were even younger, like 14-year-old Chris Espinoza, who never left. He still works at Apple almost 20 years later.